Amen. All right. How are we on volume out there? Can you hear me? All right. Amen. Oh, it's so good to worship. It's so good to worship outside the living room again. Amen. Let's pray, and then we're going to dig in. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for the day. We're so thankful for sunshine. And Lord, we're so thankful that you're faithful. You're faithful, Lord. You wouldn't let us, you wouldn't let us go away without sending your son to die in our place on the cross. You wouldn't have heaven without us, Lord. We're so thankful for that. We're so thankful that you've done the work. You've done the heavy lifting. And all we have to do is say yes, Lord. And we say yes. In Jesus' name, we receive this free gift of salvation that you've offered us. And Lord, we remember on this Easter Sunday, Lord, it wasn't, it wasn't cheap. It wasn't, it wasn't cheap. It was expensive. It cost a lot. It cost the most sacred, holy thing in the world. But you still sent him. And he, and he died in our place. And Lord, we receive it. And we agree, and we're so thankful, Lord, and we, we, reach to, we reach up today, Lord, and say yes to you in Jesus' name. Whatever it is, Lord, use us for your glory and your good and for your purposes, Lord, and let us be humble servants to you. Lead us, guide us, and keep us strong. We pray this in the name of Jesus. We all said amen. Amen. All right. So now it's sunny. Now it's this beautiful day that two days ago I wasn't sure if we would be able to even do this. They talk in rain and chilly and maybe strong winds and here's our Savior coming through so we can meet together on Easter Sunday outside. We're so thankful. So if there's ever a day, if there's ever a day to jump up and down or honk your horn or whatever, today is the day that we can rejoice that Jesus is Lord. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. And so, yeah, we should be excited about that. We should definitely uh, get excited. I gotta reorganize here, everything blew away, but you know, we we this sun Well that was weird. This excitement that we feel today, this this jubilation of Jesus is risen from the grave, the grave is empty, the tomb is empty, this feeling of joy that we have, this doesn't have to just be for today. This is a this is the joy of the Christian walk. You know, we have this every single day in our life that we've been we've been saved. You know, we're not we're not subject to the penalty of death anymore. Do we realize that? We're not subject to the rules of the laws of humankind anymore. We've been saved. And so this is how we can do it. We can express our joy, express our gratitude. We can jump up and down. We can honk our horn. We can do whatever because of this purpose, this point. Amen. This is our Savior, our hope and our peace, rescuing us from the war that we've been in, that we could never win. This day is the day that Jesus changed the world. It's the day that we went from victims of sin to victors over sin because of him. This is the day our Savior saved. This is the day he did what he does. It's Easter Sunday. Not by wit or charm or force, but by humility, by obedience, and by sacrifice. The same three qualities he calls us to do. Obedient, hum humility, and sacrifice. That's the Christian walk. In this one major power play by God. One brilliant move on the chessboard of humanity. God positioned Jesus to defeat the devil, to defeat sin. And he took back his greatest possession, which is you. He did this for you. He took you back that day. Hebrews 2, 14 through 15 says, Now since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these things, so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, and that is the devil. And free those who were held in slavery all their lives by fear of death. Jesus defeated death, and he defeated the fear of death. We don't have to be afraid of anything anymore. We don't have to be afraid of COVID-19. We don't have to be afraid of anything. Amen. There's no fear. There, there better not be any fear. If we believe Jesus is who he said he is, and he did what he said he did, how could we be afraid? Where, where would there be room for fear in this? We should not live in fear, and we absolutely shouldn't die in fear. We should die victorious, victorious, saved by the grace of God. It was by his death that our death lost its sting. Our life took on purpose and meaning because of what he did on the cross. We have this roadmap now to the afterlife. We know the path. 
Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But nobody comes to the Father except through him. And we know that. But not only did he, did he give us the roadmap for death, he gave us the roadmap for life. And that's what this is about. Easter isn't about just death. We think about Easter and we think about death. We should think about Easter and life. It's the life that he gave us. He gave us the roadmap to live a life holy, set apart, righteous, loving people. We know that Jesus sent his son to die, and it was a high cost. It was an incredible cost that, that we can't even fathom. You know, Jesus is called the begotten son of God. That doesn't mean he was born of God. It means he is part of God. Begotten means part of, from, from the same material, made from the same material as God. Begotten. So God sent himself in the, son of Jesus, in the form of Jesus Christ to die so we can live. Let's remember that. Easter isn't so we know how, we're, how to die, but so we know how to live. Amen. The death is nothing. It's the life that's important. Easter is about life. So let's take a look. Before we rest here on our Sunday Easter story, let's, let's take a look back at Friday and see what, what got us to this point. I wonder, you know, it's, we look at... We look at what Jesus went through, the suffering, the, the abuse, the beatings, the whipping, the spit on, the slap in his face, the ripped his beard hair out. If you've ever had a beard and had it ripped out, it hurts. He, he went through so much suffering that Friday. We can't really fathom it. We can't really understand what he went through for us. But I wonder at the power and the mindfulness that was displayed by Jesus that day. The day of his death, the day on the cross. He didn't defend himself. He didn't say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. That would have been me. He didn't curse those who betrayed him. He didn't get mad because they did him wrong. Or tried him unfairly. Or murdered him. He didn't resent the cross. He embraced it in humility. Right up until the moment that he breathed his last. He was loving people. He was pointing people towards the Father. He was offering forgiveness on the cross, offering forgiveness to others. Jesus never became bitter. He never got angry and he never got vengeful. All Jesus did was love. If we want to follow Jesus in our death, we need to follow him in our life. If we want to follow his path to eternity, we need to follow his path on the earth and love people, even those who hate us, even those who want to do harm to us, even the governor who wants to shut us down. We still love her in spite of her. We love her because Jesus loved her. We love people that don't look like they deserve love. It's not what they deserve because if we got what we deserve, we'd be in hell. It's not about what we deserve. It's because Jesus showed us this path to life through love. We must love like Jesus and live like Jesus. To the ones that, the, the ones that seem the farthest from and need it the most. He never sent us to win arguments. He sent us to win souls and to love people. And that's what we're called to do. That's why, that's why this is such a big deal on Easter Sunday. And as, he, and as he died on that Friday, the earth trembled. We read in the Bible, the earth trembled. The sky went dark from noon until 3 p.m. The sky was dark. Graves were open. Dead people rose out of the grave. The religious barriers of the temple were torn down. This wasn't the death of just another guy. This wasn't the death of a good prophet or a smart man. This was the death, the crucifixion of God himself, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, on the cross. This was him. And the people that were, that were around there realized it in this time. They realized what they'd done. But it, was too, how, it couldn't be changed at that point. It was beyond the reach of mankind at that time. It would take a move from God to reverse what they had done on the cross. It would take a move from God to change what they did on that Friday of convicting and killing the Savior of the world. All they could do was rush and get him off the cross and get him buried and try to get people to forget all this earthquakes and going dark and all the rumblings that were going on. All we can do is get him off the cross and bury him real fast and maybe people will forget in three weeks or a month. But that wasn't the plan. And that wasn't going to happen because you know why? Sunday was coming. 
the Son of God, the Son of Man, died on the cross that Friday to defeat sin, to defeat death, not to fall victim to death, not to be a victim of his own death, but to defeat death in one swoop. There was no grave that could hold him down. That's the title today, no grave. There's no grave that can hold our Savior down. And that's what we want to look at today. As, as important as this resurrection is, let's take a look at the empty tomb today and what the empty tomb tells us. We know what the resurrection is. The resurrection is Jesus alive. But let's take a look at the empty tomb and see what that, what that tells us. His resurrection from the dead points to his mastery over death. He mastered it. He, he defeated death forevermore. And it holds promises for you and I. The empty tomb that his disciples found that morning would not give them would only would just give them more hope and more joy, because think about this: the angels didn't have to open the tomb so Jesus could get out. Jesus could walk right through stone. That's no big deal. We see from other scripture that follows us that Jesus would enter a room and exit a room, not using a door. Jesus didn't need the rock move to get out. The angels moved the rock for you and for me. So we could see and believe. It wasn't for Jesus. He didn't need that. What happened that day sent shockwaves through eternity. It changed the, it changed the course of ma mankind. This is the day that God sent his only begotten son to defeat Satan once and for all. Sin and death and all the, all the pain and hurts of the world have been defeated. And he left us this empty tomb to prove it. While the resurrection and the empty tomb are bound together in this Easter story, we know that they are distinct. And that's what I would like to draw some, some distinction between the resurrection and the empty tomb today. In the resurrection, Jesus shows his victory over sin. I'd mention that a victory that he shares freely with all of us who want to just say, okay. That's all we have to do is say, trust in our mind that Jesus is Lord and believe with our heart that he did what he said he did. And he shares that with us. <clears throat> but unlike the resurrection... The empty tomb does not do anything for us. The tomb was opened up to prove something. It tells us that the grave could not hold Jesus, that he bodily rose from the grave, and when the angel appeared to the women at the empty grave, he told them, he is not here. He has risen, just like he said he would. Come and see the place where he lay. The empty tomb told them that Jesus indeed had been raised. It was the evidence of the resurrection. That's what it is to us. The empty tomb is our, is our evidence of what we know is true. The empty tomb is proof of the resurrection. It is proof that death is defeated. It is proof that Jesus is who he said he is. Let's read the account uh, of the empty tomb for Sunday morning from, from the, the, uh, the Gospel of Luke. And it's in Luke 24. It's on your sheet. <clears throat> and I'll read it. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in, but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, It is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. Remembering, are returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles these things. But these words seemed like nonsense to them. They did not believe the women. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. And when he stooped in to look, he saw only the linen cloth. So he went away amazed at what happened. Amen. That's the account from Luke. It was the empty tomb they found by the women, that was found by the women and later by Peter, that perplexed and amazed them. It was the empty tomb that did it. 
It was the empty tomb that proved Jesus had risen from the dead and overcame death. And it is still our proof today. And I'd like to take a few minutes here and just talk about this empty tomb and how it proves our faith in Jesus Christ, how it, how it confirms everything we know. Most critics of Jesus refuse to believe the empty tomb. That's, that's, where, they, that's where they can find some, some, some points to disagree on is, is the empty tomb. Some have objected that the empty tomb story, some have rejected the empty tomb story by claiming it was, uh, it was a legend. It was just a, over the years it happened. They, they kind of built this story up to, to prove Christianity. Rather than historical fact, we know it's historical fact. But one of the most compelling evidence is showing that the tomb story is true is that it was first discovered by women. Now why is that? Why does that matter? This is significant because in this day and age of Jesus, women weren't used in court to testify. They, they weren't trusted with the truth. They, they weren't treated equally like, they, like we are now. Like, so for a woman to be used by Jesus to reveal the truth, that doesn't even make sense. If you were going to pull a fast one, you wouldn't use a woman to do it. You'd have Peter do it. Or you'd have John do it. Or one of the other disciples, one of the men... Go and say, yeah, this happened. You wouldn't tell a woman because nobody believed a woman anyway. So for Jesus to appear to a woman first is totally Jesus. It's a Jesus thing. It wouldn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in our logical mind or their logical mind back then to use a woman. But that's exactly how Jesus did it. I thought Sherry might honk on that one. <laughs> Very rarely was a woman allowed even in court they weren't even allowed to give testimony. So that's, how, that's, that's one thing that we can take and say, you know what? It's definitely a Jesus thing because Jesus doesn't do things the way that we make sense in our minds, does he? Never has. What next? <clears throat> These women that were mentioned, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and the mother of Jesus and the mother of, of James, all these women were brave. Weren't they? We see, we see these women on Friday hanging tough, staying right there and watching the cross. But the disciples ran. The men ran, most of them, except for John. They were hiding. They, were scurry, they scurried away like mice in the light. They ran. In Jesus' darkest hour, it was the women who were right there. Yet the Jewish leaders tried to credit these men with Stealing a body? That, that's, the other, that's the other thing they tried to say. Is, is The disciples stole Jesus' body out of the tomb. That's why the tomb was empty. These guys were scared. Peter, Peter denied Jesus three times. You really think he, Peter's going to go to the tomb, guarded by Roman soldiers, and pull off a fast one? I don't think so. There's no way. There's no way these guys had enough courage to go and steal Jesus' body. It just couldn't have happened. So the Jewish leaders took extra precautions. It says that, that they, to ensure that Jesus' burial site, the, a new unused tomb was, that belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, was guarded by a unit of highly trained Roman soldiers. This guard, this guard unit of between four and ten soldiers knew they would face severe punishment if they screwed this up. They knew if they blew this, this job of guarding this tomb, they could be killed. So they were diligent. Some slept while others watched, and they rotated. They didn't, they didn't take this job lightly of guarding Jesus' tomb. This wasn't just a, an easy Saturday morning job. This was a big deal for them. If Jesus' body went missing on their watch, they knew it would be their death. So to think that these soldiers fell asleep somehow or, or didn't notice somebody coming in to, to rob the grave, that's, that's, that's impossible. It's just not even... That's not even a thought that would be, it's a crazy thought. That's not how it possibly could have worked. Matthew 28 verses 1 through 4 says, After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, approached the tomb, he rolled back the stone that was, and he was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing was white as snow. The guards 
were so shaken by fear, they became like dead men. Your, your, Roman, your Roman soldiers fainted. They got scared and fainted, passed out. Because the angel of the Lord showed up. These ruthless Roman soldiers that were so well known and feared by everyone, the Bible says they fainted. They got scared and, and fell down. As God's chosen angel appeared and rolled this multi-ton stone away from the tomb entrance, think about the scene. I like how the Bible commentator Matthew Henry put it. He says, the angels sitting upon the stone after he rolled it away shows a secure triumph over all the obstructions of Christ's resurrection. He sat there defying all the powers of hell and rolled away the stone. Who knows these soldiers? You know, I, I like to think when I read about the Bible and read stories from the Bible that these people who persecuted Christians or persecuted Jesus, maybe eventually they, they came to faith in Christ and got saved. And I wonder if these Roman soldiers who fainted because of the angels, maybe they came to Jesus at some point, put their faith in Christ and got saved. We can only hope. Many theories have been put forth to discredit this resurrection. One of the earliest one of the, another one of the early early uh, assertions is that the tomb the tomb site wasn't even known, like it was an unknown site. Well, that that doesn't make sense either. This idea doesn't doesn't even flow. We know Joseph of Arimathea knew where his tomb was. Uh, Nicodemus knew where it was. The uh, the disciples knew where it was. The women who went and checked on it knew where it was. It wasn't a secret. That's not even a possibility that there the, there was an unknown site. That's that's not even a realistic. Um, that's not even a realistic excuse. The guards clearly knew. Everybody knew where the site was. So we can dispute that one right off the bat. I'd like to take a second and just point out five, and this, is, this will wrap this up, but I want to point out five important facts that we can hold on to that prove the empty tomb is true. And the first thing, the, the, first, the first point that we can hold on to and, and share with people who say, why do you believe what you believe? We can share this. The Roman seal... The Roman seal on the, on the stone was broken. And this seal represented the full force of Rome. We don't always, I don't think we always comprehend the, the situation in Israel at the time, but you didn't cross Rome. Like that just, you just didn't. You were going to be killed. If you crossed Rome, if you did something to, to you know, affect Rome, you, were, you would be killed. And so their, their seal on this stone basically said, basically said, don't touch it. If you touch it, you'll die. And, and the Jews weren't going weren't to go against that. Even for Jesus, the Jews couldn't, couldn't have done anything about it. Anyone seeking to steal Jesus' body would have had to be very aware that in doing so, they were taking on the full Roman guard. They were taking on the whole, on Rome. Would Jesus' disciples have dared to do so? With what we just mentioned? They were scurrying and hiding and frightened. I don't think they would have. I just don't think they had... I don't think they had the, the nerve in that moment to do it. Even Peter, who, who denied Christ three times, there, there's just no way he could have organized this and, and made it happen. So we see that the Roman seal was broken. The only ones that could have done that is God himself. The second thing is the stone was rolled away. I know most of the pictures we see of, of the tomb, the stone is kind of rolled a little bit and like three quarters open or, or half open or whatever, but it's kind of rolled sideways. That's really not how the scripture reads, especially if you read it, um, the original text from the old, from the original the original text. It says, uh, "Not only had the heavy stone been rolled away, but it was rolled up an incline." So we got this multi-ton stone being moved up. The Greek word for roll is kulio, kulio, uh, and in his gospel, Mark uses the word anakulio, ana, which means up. So. The stone was rolled up, which, again, a few men weren't, wouldn't be able to do that. In the, in the Gospel of Mark, he added, I'm sorry, I just, um, it was in the, I'm sorry. <clears throat> the, also, the preposition of the word uh, coolio was, was apo. In, in Luke's Gospel, he said apocoolio. Uh, which means separated from or, or not next to each other anymore. So the stone wasn't just pushed away a little bit. It was separated from the tomb. It was away. So it would be like for me to Cleo away, if this was the tomb entrance, 
Somehow the stone was now way over there. Again, th a few men couldn't do it. John's account, John used the word arrow, arrow uh, which means carried away. It, was, it wasn't just moved, it was carried away. These three things prove that it couldn't have been done by men. Men couldn't have done it. To be carried up, moved up a hill and, and moved away, prove it wasn't a man-made thing. The next thing is the grave cloths, the grave clothes remained. These grave clothes that we read in John especially, Jesus was gone, but his grave clothes bore witness to the resurrection. Jesus' dead body was wrapped in linen cloths containing um, uh, aromatic, uh, aromatic spices with a gummy substance of, of myrrh. So this myrrh would have stuck to Jesus' body. Like the grave clothes would have been stuck to him, like literally adhered to his body. So think about this. The, the disciples say they somehow got the stone moved away, fought off the Roman soldiers, got into the tomb. Now they undressed the, the grave clothes off Jesus and folded them neatly and left them on the thing. There's no way. There's just no, there's no possible way. For one thing, the grave clothes would have been, would have been soiled with this myrrh. You know, in best case scenario, they say the disciples did all that stuff leading up to this. They're going to grab Jesus' body and run. It's, it's going to be a grab and dash, not a spend hours, to, you know, taking grave clothes off and folding them and cleaning them. It just, it just doesn't add up. The fourth thing is the guards were paid to keep silent. We read in the account, uh, I think it's in uh, Matthew, and I, it could be Luke, but the guards were paid to keep their mouth shut. The Jewish leaders immediately understood that they had a problem. Something happened here that they couldn't explain and they didn't want eyewitnesses talking about it. And so they paid these Roman guards a big chunk of money to keep their mouth shut, to claim that they fell asleep. That was their story, is they fell asleep and, and the, the disciples came in and stole the body. That was, that was what they paid them to say. Obviously, the Jewish, the Jewish leaders and the, and the Roman leaders knew they had a problem on their hands because Rome doesn't pay off people. They just didn't. It wasn't something they did very often. So for them to pay the, the soldiers to, to stay quiet, there was another giant red flag popping up. And number five, this is the last one. Jesus was seen by many, many people after the resurrection. We know that Jesus appeared to the women and to the disciples and to numerous and, and numerous times, not just once or twice, but over and over he appeared to, to the disciples. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, Christ died for our sins. Just as the scripture said, he was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Just as the scripture said, he, he was seen by Peter and then by the 12. And after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Okay, there's no reason Paul would have mentioned all that, the 500, the disciples, unless he's saying, hey, your witnesses are here. If you, if you don't believe the tomb was empty that day, go ask them. There's 500 witnesses walking around Jerusalem right now. Go ask them. And they'll tell you the same thing that, that Jesus has told me. The tomb was empty that day. There's eyewitnesses. And you couldn't pay these 500 eyewitnesses to keep their mouth shut. So we can walk away this Sunday, this Easter Sunday, beautiful day that we've had. We can walk away this morning knowing that Jesus did what he said he did. He died. He was raised from the dead on the third day. And, and when we receive that, we don't have to worry about anything anymore. We know it by proof. We know it by the proof that was written in the Bible that I mentioned today. We know, it, we know that this story is true because the Bible proves it. We know it by the fact that the church, the church is still growing 2,000 some years later. The church is still growing and thriving all over the world. If this was fake, people don't die for, for a lie. They don't. None of us would die for a lie. And so for, for disciples to all die in the way they died, for people to be martyred up to 2020, people are still dying for their faith. We know from that, from that point right there that it's got to be true. And we know it's true because of Jesus and what he's done to each one of our lives individually. We know our lives have changed so much from our life before Jesus to our life with Jesus. My, my witness, your witness, our witness is proof enough on top of everything else we know to be true. Our life is a living, a living testimony to the, 
to the truth of Jesus Christ's resurrection. How sweet it is to live our lives with hope and live our life with love because we have the king of the world living in our hearts. We weren't born in this life to die. We weren't born to go to heaven. That's not the point. That's a great perk, but that's not the point. We were born to be disciples. We were born to tell people about Jesus in this life. Not to wait it out and wait till we go home someday. Yeah, this isn't our home. We're sojourners here passing through, but while we're here, let's make a difference. Let's be this loving light of the world that, that is something people want. Not something people are afraid of or, or hate or despise, but, but loving people. Not because, like I said before, not because they deserve it, not because they're so great, but because Jesus is. And that's what we're called to do. Let's live it. Let's live it well. We, are, we know that we're secure. We don't have to worry about anything that goes on on the earth. All we, all we have to worry about is telling somebody about Jesus. Amen? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Uh, Cleo, come up here and we can pray. And uh, we're not going to open it up today just because it would be too complicated. So we'll pray and we'll close it down. So Heavenly Father, Lord, again, just thank you for this day. Thank you for this beautiful weather. Lord, thank you for your son. Lord, what a blessing it is to come together uh, and worship you together. Worship you uh, on your on, on the day that you were left the tomb empty for us to see. Left us proof. Lord, you didn't have to move the stone. You didn't need it. You could have walked out of the grave and never, and never moved the stone, but you moved the stone so we could understand, so we could see, so we could have proof that Jesus is Lord and he's risen from the dead. Lord, just let us be a light in this dark world. Let us be lovers of people. Let us be, let us be the ones that people come to when there's problems. Let us be the ones that, that have the, the source of life and the, Lord, the things that the world craves so much. Hope and love and mercy and grace. And Lord, it's just because of you that we're able to share these things. We pray this in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. 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 Amen.